After the release of Nvidia's G80 cards in late 2006, the high-end GPU market was more active than ever, with cards like the 8800 GTX and GTS offering up monster performance and DirectX 10 capability. With all this success, people were excited to see some more affordable options help usher in this new era of DirectX, and while cheap cards from both ATI and Nvidia would come in mid-2007, they would fail to take off due to very underwhelming performance. But there was one card that sought to change this, and the result was an option that revitalized the stale mid-range market and convinced many gamers that they desperately needed an affordable upgrade. This card was the GeForce 8800 GT. The card is built with a slightly cut down G92 GPU which features 112 stream processors and comes clocked at 600MHz. For memory we have 512MB of GDDR3 clocked at 900MHz which is running on a 256 bit bus making for 57GB per second of memory bandwidth. The card's TDP is reported to be 125 watts, and as such it requires one 6 pin peg connector for external power. Before we talk about the 8800 GT itself, we need to have a quick recap on the events leading up to its release. First, let's go back to April of 2007, where to much anticipation Nvidia launched their first Tesla card to hit the mainstream market, the GeForce 8600 GTS. While it was priced right at $199 USD and the only option at that price point with DirectX 10 support, the card ended up being received quite poorly. Now, This was mainly due to some very lukewarm performance, as the 8600 would struggle to match mid-range offerings from the last generation while costing the same or more. This wouldn't have been as bad if the 8800 GTS 320 didn't exist, as that card was only around $75 more but offered nearly double the performance and the same feature set sans the new video processing engine, but for a majority of gamers this was not a concern and the lower end offerings in the stack also had this while being cheaper and consuming less power. It simply made no sense to go for the 8600 GTS as it only stagnated the mid-range market. Considering the hype and success around the 8800 GTX and GTS cards, this mainstream offering was a huge letdown. People wanted fast and cheap DX10 hardware, and it seemed that Nvidia wouldn't be delivering on that. Yet. What people didn't know was that Nvidia was already at work on a refresh of the venerable G80, which was dubbed G92. It was essentially Tesla refined, and was shaping up to be very compelling. G92 was essentially a tweaked and optimized G80 with some extra functionality on board like that updated video processing engine and all of the display logic that was previously off chip on G80. Best of all, it was fabbed on the new 65 nanometer process, which resulted in a much smaller GPU that consumed less power and was cheaper to produce than its predecessor. Later in 2007, this chip would find its way into what was perhaps one of the best value cards Nvidia has ever made, the legendary 8800 GT. While this card didn't support any major architectural or even performance advancements over its predecessors, it had one ace up its sleeve, the value. At the time of its release, the 8800 GT was easily able to subdue the $350 GTS 640 and even hung in there with the $500 8800 GTX, all while costing around 250 to 300 USD. With a price like that, it easily cannibalized Nvidia's entire lineup at the time and with ATI yet to strike back, the 8800 GT was left completely uncontended. Years later, this card definitely left an impression on a lot of people, and is known to be one of the most popular and best value graphics cards to have ever released. With some background out of the way, let's now have a quick look at today's sample. This is EVGA's super clocked variant, which uses the reference PCB and features a 50 MHz increase on both the core and memory, certainly not a large leap above reference speed, so we'll be pushing it a little further for our overclock testing. When I purchased it, this card originally had an old Thermaltake Duorb, but I figured it was way too overkill for this little guy, so I swapped it with a smaller Zalman cooler for my overheating X1900 XTX, and it's a much better fit for this thing, with temps never going above 75C in my testing. Moving on to some overclocking, this time I opted not to increase the voltage, as the card was able to manage 725MHz on the core and 1782MHz on the shader clock just at the stock voltage, which was surprising to see. For memory, I went for a smaller increase to the tune of 1025 MHz. Now, this makes for a pretty respectable increase over stock, and is almost on par with its G92B successor. Now that we have the card dialed in, it's time to see what this old champ can do. For the setup, I used my usual test bed with an overclocked 3770K and 16 gigs of DDR3, all on a Gigabyte Z77X UD5H. As always, I'll include more detailed specs as well as the drivers used on screen. And with all that being said, let's now dig into some testing. And the first game up is Fear. 
Here I completely maxed out the settings at 1080p and used a 55 second run of the built in benchmark to get my numbers. Here the 8800 GT put down 69 frames per second on average with 1% lows down at 32. Overclocked we jumped 16% to 80 FPS with 1% lows also up 16% to 37. Frame times were fairly lackluster as the car definitely had a couple of hiccups here and there. It's to be expected with this benchmark though and still not a bad showing for this card. Next up is another famous system killer, Crisis. Now I tested the game at 1080p with a medium preset and no AA. Stock the 8800 GT scores 52 frames per second on average, with 1% lows down to 40. Overclocked averages saw a 17% jump to 61, with 1% lows rising 15% to 46. Frame times were very solid during the run, and overall it made for a pretty great experience. Now you'll notice the frame time lengths are different, and this is because the built-in benchmark renders a fixed number of frames, and since the game engine is tied to the frame rate in this benchmark, some setups will finish at different times. Stalker Call of Pripyat is the next game I tested. Now here I use the standalone benchmarking utility at 1080p with the medium preset in DX10 mode. The 8800 GT averages 58 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 31. Overclocked averages rose 16% to 67, with 1% lows rising 23% to 38. Frame times were all right, but there were a few moderate swings around the middle of the benchmark. On the whole though, it's a pretty decent result considering how demanding this game can be. Next is Far Cry 2, and I ran the game at 1080p using the high preset as well as medium textures to keep within our VRAM limits. The card put down 55 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 45. Overclocked we jumped 16% to 64, with 1% lows also rising 16% to 52. Now unfortunately our frame times were not so hot, as there were numerous swings above 60 milliseconds in our capture, which reflects in the dismal 0.1% lows. Not quite sure why, but I've always experienced this using DX10 with Far Cry 2, and I'm tempted to only use DX9 mode in the future. Moving on to some newer games, we have Metro Last Light, and it's definitely one of the hardest to run in this suite, so I use 720p along with a low preset and 16x AF. In our 160 second run of the built in benchmark, the card eked out 39 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 24. Overclocked, we jumped 15% to 45 FPS, with 1% lows rising 17% to 28. Frame times definitely saw some inconsistencies, and there was a particularly bad swing around the first few seconds of the benchmark that was repeatable in multiple runs. The spike would still occur when overclocked, but was much improved. Definitely interesting to see. Second to last game is GTA 5, and I settled for 720p with the normal settings throughout and used the last segment of the built in benchmark for testing. Stock, the 8800 GT averaged 47 frames per second, with 1% lows way down to 22. Overclocked averages jumped by a really nice 21% to 57, with 1% lows rising 32% to 29. Now, looking at the frame times, yikes. They were all over the place here, with loads of harsh swings throughout the whole run. With an overclock, they improved a little bit, but the game was still kind of a jittery mess. I figured the card would do alright here, but that doesn't seem to be the case, even with the settings cranked down like this. And the last game up is Tomb Raider. Here I just used the high preset at 1080p and used the built-in benchmark for testing. Stock, we averaged 31 frames per second, with 1% lows down to 24. Overclocked, averages jumped 16% to 36 FPS, with 1% lows increasing 17% to 28. Frame times were very good here, with only a couple of minor swings in our 60 second run. At these settings, the game is a bit more on the sluggish side, but still looks great and is very playable. Bringing our testing to a close, I ran Unage in Heaven to get some power draw figures. I used a static steam to allow the car to stabilize at its maximum temperature, and took a measurement of the entire system from the wall, so keep in mind that PSU efficiency hasn't been factored in here. With that said, the entire system consumed just 170 watts, and overclocked this number rose only 7% to 182 watts. Considering the good performance jump when overclocked, it was nice to see this minimal increase in power draw. Now if I actually dialed in the voltage and went for some more aggressive clocks, I bet the increase would have been much higher, but this is still a great result.
For my overall thoughts on this card, I will say it makes sense why people look back on it so fondly. You have to consider, the mid-range market was in a pretty bad place before the release of the 8800 GT. With all of the poor mainstream options before this card, it was such a breath of fresh air for value seekers. It's able to do very well in games of its time and even power through later releases, meaning you'd continue to get your money's worth for years to come. It's quite a stark contrast compared to today's landscape, where viable options in the $200 range are few and far between. Also wanted to note I was very impressed with overclocking on this card, as with these settings and this test suite there's around a 17% improvement to be had overall. That's some impressive scaling, and taking into account the meager increase in power draw and heat output, I'd say it's the best way to run the card. Anyhow, that about wraps up my time with the 800 GT, not gonna lie I'm left rather impressed with what it can do. I definitely plan to make more content featuring this card in the future, but for now it's on to other cards. With that, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.